Is it on? Oh, there you go. I just have to get closer here. All right, I'll get down in here. Okay, my name is Bill Perkins, and I'm doing a, 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 a color boot camp, a, a painting class and uh, here. And uh, I first kind of arrived at this, the idea of this um, type of a class because um, when I was in college, I, was, I took some color theory classes, and I was very interested in it. And it was all very technical, a lot of information. And, um, and like a lot of the rest of the students, I had a difficult time applying the theory to actual painting. We do color swatches, color chips, learn ideas, concepts. And, um, and then how you turn around and apply that to a painting was a little bit ambiguous. So um, it wasn't until a couple years out of college that I was, when I uh, finished college, I graduated from Art Center. Um, in illustration, but I wanted to paint. So after I graduated, I, I took off and started painting for galleries. And after a couple of years, I was kind of stuck with some paintings, and I was really focused on, you know, how do you make yourself better when you're not in school? How do you keep growing as an artist? So um, uh, I got stuck with a painting, and I knew something was wrong with it. I wasn't quite sure. I went back to those original notes, and um, I kind of started reading through, and they all started making sense. Um, after putting in a couple years of just practice, but um, I realized that um, if I learned color theory through painting from real life situations, I would have learned it to apply it directly, learned right away. So what I did was I got the idea to do something like this. I was I started teaching some painting classes. I work full time at Disney. Um, I work for their in their animation department. I'm an art director for their animated films, and um, so I do keep I teach a class at night um, so that I can keep painting, and it forces me to do that. But it keeps me um, researching and looking at things and stuff. So I started doing a painting class, and the painting class soon turned into this color theory workshop, and um, because I found that as I was trying to teach painting the same problems I ran across, everybody else was dealing with the same issues. So what I did was I took the idea of color theory, like I'm doing in the class now, um, I'll set up the models in a certain manner, and I'll set up the lighting condition and the backgrounds, the color, everything in a condition that plays out a particular color theory. Then I can ask the students, just paint what you see. And I'll put the notes together, and the notes are actually the notes that will apply to color theory that actually works with uh, the way you do your painting. So it seems that you can learn uh, color theory in a, in a direct application, um, which seems to work out pretty good, I think. Um, and what I stripped it down from um, uh, the color theory notes that I was kind of taking was a combination of perceptual color, um, um, you know, theory in general based on prismatic light, and also um, in an emotional context of color, color relationships. But I found that the actual perceptual color we could address directly through painting from models or real life. So I focus on perceptual relationships of color. So that's how we kind of broke it down to simplify it and move straight through. So um, anyway, that's pretty much about the class. Um, like I said, I, I graduated from Art Center in Pasadena. Uh, and once I did, I decided I wanted to paint and so I traveled around um, and painted. Um, actually, a year before I finished school, I decided I didn't want to do illustration. And uh, I went back. I took a year off and started painting. And my father was, uh, my mother was an artist. And my father was uh, in, uh, an art director for ad agency. So I was really lucky from that standpoint from the very beginning. But um, I took a year off trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I met a guy who was making a living selling paintings. So um, I started doing that, and uh, I did it for a year, saved some money, went back to school, got my degree, and as my friends were you know, getting agents and going out in the commercial world, um, I went directly to a tax account and said, how do I travel around the world and do it for free? And um, write it all off. And uh, he told me, so that's what I started doing. So about for five years, uh, I traveled around and uh, set up shows uh, based on the trips that I took so I could afford to, to put it all together. Um, that, I, I finished about five years. Uh, I had a goal to uh, have a museum show. 
and um, before I was 30, that was my big thing out of school and uh, that I wanted to do. So um, I knew that was something that was pretty lofty and I didn't know if I could do it myself. So I gathered some other artists that had a similar interest and similar direction. And uh, the idea of going to Europe for three months and painting seemed good to them. So we, uh, I wrote up a treatment for our plan and then um, we went to Europe for three months. We got the uh, Monterey Peninsula Museum um, had a show for us. It was a group show based on three months of painting through Spain and Italy and, um, and France. And so um, we put that together. And I, the, the group fell apart. The show was, exp was really good, worked out really well. We all got into really good galleries and it uh, looked like the future was going to be really bright. And then we hit a recession and the galleries closed. <laughs> so uh, out of that, I realized five years of painting by myself or doing something bigger with a group of people seemed pretty interesting. So I kind of sat down and look at, okay, if I wasn't painting full time, what would I do otherwise? And uh, so animation kind of came onto my radar at that point. And I thought, okay, well, those are big projects and done by collaborative, it's a collaborative art form. So I kind of jumped into that and, um, and found that I really liked it. It was a great time to start at Disney's 1984. 1985, and um, and so I worked there for about nine years, and um, they had a, a good string of hits starting in, what, it was 87, I think was the first one, and then um, <coughs> and uh, they went through Oliver and Company and uh, Little Mermaid and Rescuers Down Under, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin into Lion King, and I did a little bit on Fantasia, and then I left, I started working at other studios and, and uh, uh, just kind of going show to show. And then I, I uh, opened my own studio and had a small team of people. We did design movies that were done overseas. So we designed them in one location here. And uh, uh, we'd set up the whole look for the show and put a whole package together. Um, the challenge of art directing, something where I wasn't even there during the production, seemed to be a pretty daunting thing. So I wanted to try that out, see how that was. And I found I really enjoyed that. And now uh, there are shorter schedules, the faster, um, lighter budgets. And, and um, you know, we didn't have the burden of, you know, close to $200 million on our shoulders. <laughs> it's a little lighter, but it's faster as well. It's a really fast pace, but I really enjoyed that. So um, um, that's what pretty much what I'm doing now. Um, um, I, I brought some images that I can show you. These were some of the images that, um, let me just, I think I can just take these and put them in preview. You have a dock on here? Where is it? You hide in the dock somewhere? Yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah. There we go. Where am I here? Where's preview on here? You got it on here? You right click on it? Wait a second. Excuse me for my bumbling fingers here. File select all, huh? Yeah. Or where? Oh. We'll get there. We're going to do this all together. There we go. Now it shows up. Okay. Anyway, these these are. Um, uh, some of the paintings that I was doing uh, before I got involved in animation. Um, uh, this was 
Fourth of July. Absolutely, it was painted on the Fourth of July out my bathroom window of my house in Manhattan Beach, <laughs> and uh, got up one morning and it was it was interesting color combination out there just before they tore that house down. So I wanted to connect that. Um, I first started when I was in school. I was started playing with watercolors, and and when I took a year off, I was doing primarily watercolors and started out with that. Uh, the person that I met, Richie Benson, was a watercolorist who um, kind of showed me the ropes with watercolor. And so um, I started with that and enjoyed doing that. And then uh, I did it for a couple of years. And then I realized um, he showed me how to paint really quickly and in a certain manner and with a limited palette. But I wanted to expand my palette, and I really couldn't do it with that, that pace. So I kind of put the watercolors away for uh, about a year and a half and just painted with oils. And, um, and then uh, after th my trip to Europe, I, this was one of them that I did on the, on the trip. After the trip, um, I had a friend who was just starting an organization. Uh, it was the Planar Painters of America. And she contacted me because she couldn't go on our three-month trip. So she contacted me and asked if I would uh, be interested in joining that. So I was a member of the Plain Air Painters of America for um, a number of years um, until the animation kind of took up all my time and I, and I had to uh, forego that. But um, these were uh, like class demonstrations, um, little demos, watercolor demos that I would do. This is a series of, of um, paintings. I worked for ILM up in San Francisco for a while. So one afternoon it was slow and I went with uh, uh, I was a production designer, so I took one of my art directors over to um, the exposition building. We painted one afternoon, but I realized when I was packing up, uh, we painted the second painting, and uh, I realized when I was packing up, um, the light had changed, and it looked even more interesting, and it was the third painting. So I, I uh, came back the next day to finish the first painting and start the next one, and uh, as I was packing up the second one, uh, <laughs> it got dark, and uh, I, uh, traffic was really busy going over the bridge. So I had something to eat. And when I drove past, the, uh, the lights were on the building. And it looked totally different. So I took a photo there. And then I went back in the morning. And um, I sketched them all up at home to try to figure out wh why the lighting changed, what happens with different times of day, and you know, just for my own exploration so I could have a constant model and kind of work with that. But these were um, versions of, of the same building. Um, I was just playing with different um, uh, color schemes, working out different color arrangements. Um, I, uh, I have a wife and two daughters and a son, and my, my kids are all terrified that I'll drag them out of bed as I drag my daughter out of bed in the middle of the morning to take this picture. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll, I'll snag them to pose them anywhere I can. Um, uh, this was a painting I did over at the Rose Estate in Pasadena. Um, and then uh, this one, I, this one I did. I wanted to kind of get away from real space. I wanted to do a, a little bit more abstract space and design. I didn't want to, um, you know, rely on just just um, uh, physical, um, you know, form rendering. So I, I kind of leaned more towards this type of a, a flatter design to, to work with for fun. Um, uh, this is a watercolor I did last last year over at uh, Annecy. I, I had a little short film that I released over there at, um, or I did a short film for Disney that released uh, over there at a film festival. So I, I went over there, and while I was there, I, I did a little watercolor class, and, and um, this is one of the little paintings that I did for that. And um, so that's kind of a, a range of, of things that I've been working on. Um, open this up. I've been doing some drawings just lately, too, or I've been doing them over the years, really, but um, um, this is, I just figured I'd throw some of these things in here, and because um, I was kind of having fun with this. This was, this was something that um, I stopped on the way to work. It was really, really windy, and I stopped on the way to work, and I pulled over to a Starbucks to get a cup of coffee, and um, as I was getting in my car, this gal was, you know, walking, and it was really windy. She was kind of leaning backward as she was walking, and then she um, 
you know, put this cup on the top of her car and, and uh, op un opened it and then, you know, got in trying to juggle these two cups of coffee. And I, I sat there for a moment and I watched and then um, uh, I started up my car. I was getting ready to go. I thought, you know, that, that would have been a nice drawing. And then I, I kind of stopped the car and I realized, well, if not now, when? <laughs> I would never do this drawing unless I just sat down and did it now. So I turned the key off and I grabbed my book and, and drew it right then and just kind of did it from memory. So I was kind of playing with that. But um, over at Disney, we have um, one day, one evening a week where we have models coming in that will, you know, with different themes and stuff like that. So these are just things that I kind of do, just kind of exploring different um, different ideas, um, different characters. This is, that was for um, s the Spiderwick Chronicles. I did a little design work for them, uh, for that show. These were, you know, again, just themed little drawings. I just, I, r I really enjoy doing these as just kind of a, a, a fun kind of exploration of, of dealing with line and, and just shapes and, and some forms, so. Well, I guess I have to wait for him to, I've been kind of blitzing through these. There we go. But these are all kind of fun, and they do it, they do it for the animators and stuff, but I, I usually kind of jump right in there and, and look at those. And um, then I think the other things I had were just some of the things that I did at work. I threw some things in. Um, see, and now I'm getting the hang of this. I think I can, I get used to this. I'll do it right next time. Um, I I did some development for uh, Bolt. Um, was an animated film, and these were some little um, concept paintings for some matte paintings that we ended up doing later for the the show. But uh, I ran through that. Um, I was an art director on Aladdin, and um, this was, um, I had an idea about, because I came into animation from a collaborative standpoint, I didn't come to, uh, I didn't go to school to do animation, and I didn't go with the idea that I was gonna make my movie or it was gonna be all about me. I went in from the standpoint that I wanted to kind of explore an, um, a collaborative art form. So when I got a chance to art direct a film, Aladdin was the first one that I art directed. When I got a chance to do that, um, I had worked on like five movies prior, and um, the first movie that I wa worked on, um, the art director was fired, and the head of layout uh, ran away in the middle of production. And uh, <laughs> the second movie that I worked on, the um, art director was the head of layout, and he was overwhelmed with work. Very talented artist, but it was just too much for one person. He had to kind of give it up. Um, the third movie um, that I worked on, um, they had a layout, uh, or the art director was totally frustrated and uh, ready to quit or turn his hair on fire and run out of the building. That's what he threatened. And, um, and then the next show, um, again, the art director was fired and the head of layout ran away in the middle of the show. And so uh, Aladdin was the following show. And when they asked me to art direct, I asked them, is there something wrong here with the art director position? Because they keep getting fired or thrown out or frustrated. And or running away, and their uh, response really was, "Well, do you want it or not?" They were just really, you know. So you're a one-person department um, with a crew of. It started out as 400 and went to 600 people, but um, I realized that the other previous art directors, as talented as they were, I kind of kept a journal of what was going on, and in most cases, they tried to design everything, and in a collaborative world. Um, I mean, if we're all artists and we're working on the same movie, if, if I design everything and hand it to you to finish, I'd kind of rob you of your creative involvement. And I, and I realized after watching this after show after show that um, I was going to try it a different way. So I, instead of designing the movie, what I did was I tried to look at, well, I had certain influences, Persian miniatures and Al Hirschfeld, uh, his work, and so I had to, combine those and figure out what that was like and invent a drawing style that was unique to this movie and for this movie only. And so um, in doing that, in, uh, kind of inventing a style, I realized that it was better to 
design basically an, a conceptual looking glass that I would give to the artists. And in terms of the final rendering of whatever they designed, it would just go through that filter. So instead of, instead of designing everything, what I did was I kind of designed the glue that held the world together. And I used a, a style guide to show how things would go together. Um, and then what I did was uh, I gave that to them. It was a large document. I gave it to them. And we just designed the movie on the fly. It was the great designers and it all went out great. So I was happy with that. Um, and then one more minute. All right. I'll zip through a couple of these things. This is the kind of st more commercial stuff. This was, uh, uh, I know it's small up here, but it's, it, this was an image. It was a design for a, a show that was, um, they wanted, they had a house style. The studio had a house style. And they wanted to do a movie that would be um, taking place in Africa. So I had to research African art, which was a lot of fun. And I found that um, the research for each movie along the way, um, the movies come and go, but the research has been so much fun. And y you learn a lot and because it's a requirement to um, know as much as you can uh, about everything you can about the movie so that professionals and um, um, you know people that are, are professional in any topic we take up um, they see that there, there's truth to all the material so it all works together so we kind of have to uh, dig pretty deep this is what's called a color script or a lighting guide uh, this is for a little short film that I did so I manage the lighting and color that will take place to to enhance the the different story points as they go so that's one of the um, little location keys and ideas. This was for Shrek. It was one little, this was another sketch that they ended up looking like. Did some things for a Tinkerbell, which was a Peter Pan short. And there I was looking at the space and how to deal with space. The original artists were looking at, um, the, they were looking at um, cubist work and things like that. So I wanted to kind of employ the same types of concepts in the design and and how you handle space. So I was working with that um, without perspective, just creating a, um, an arc proscenium um, and flattened ground or um, tilted ground planes and stuff. So I worked with that to create that same look that the original movie had. These are just some paintings, sketches for the different shows. Um, Winnie the Pooh had a lot of drawings involved, so I did a lot of little design work for them. and kind of goes on. That's kind of the stuff that I do over there so for some different shows. This is an early version of Princess of Mars when it was at uh, Paramount. And then Space Jam, um, creating a color scheme that would contrast the Warner Brothers characters. So. That's pretty much it. I mean, I enjoy I enjoy the the collaborative work, but I also enjoy the the classes and stuff. So it kind of keeps me bouncing back and forth. And um, I think I ran out of time. Um, boy, he's tall. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, what I'd like to do is just show you the images and not talk, um, if I can avoid it. Um, and just, that's it. I'm going to show them. No. How do I do that? No. Oh. Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, all right. I'm going to talk. These first, these first ones are like an overview of the kind of things that I'm interested in, and I'm interested in doing paintings of my garden, doing abstracts, which I'm enthralled with. Um, 
um, acrylics and watercolor and, and cows. I'm enthralled with cows. I love cows. Um, my father had his own cow. Um, he had a Jersey cow, a calf, and he left it. He let it in the house sometimes. My grandfather was a cattle judge and raised dairy cattle in Michigan, so um, so th that's why I love cows. <laughs> I could go slower, but I don't have very much time. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, I'll go a little bit fast, slower. Okay, this is a watercolor, and then this is an acrylic of the same. These are watercolors. You can notice they're starting to get more and more abstract, and it's only in retrospect that I know, know all this. While I was doing it, I wasn't thinking at all. Now they've lost their, I mean, this is progressive. I mean, this is chronologic. They lost their shadows. There was a, um, there was a um, slaughterhouse at the end of our road. And I started really thinking about how, how, um, how fragile their lives were, especially these, these Charlet. And, and then I started doing, this was my philosophical, I was thinking, which is the real, which exists now? And it's the upper one, of course, that exists now because the bottom one is, she's dead, you know. I started dividing the paper into various things. Yes, yes, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> All of these have um, a lot of content that I don't, you know, don't want to talk about, of course. I was a vegetarian for six months, I think. <coughs> then I decided that I was um, being one for the wrong reasons, um, that I was putting myself above the animals because they were always chomping on each other, and uh, I wasn't doing it for the right reasons. This is done 20 years after those first ones. So I, I, I keep coming back to some themes. A lot of this I can't, I don't want to talk about, but you can see there's stuff going on in there. Um, This is a real, this is my garden. So at the same time, I'm uh, having a wonderful garden and crazy about poppies and growing huge fields of poppies every year, which I still do. And that's a recent poppy patch in the garden. This is in Tennessee. I live, we live in Tennessee. That's part of the garden too. And then the following, these are paintings of the garden. This is watercolor. Watercolor and watercolor. Yeah. Something. This is huge. This is four feet by eight feet. This is acrylic. I mean, eight feet long, you know. This is a big watercolor. But remember, I was doing the cows at the same time, well not at the same, not on the same day, but you know, in the same era. And then one day I put them together. <laughs> and I did lots of these. And 
you, you who were in my class remember I was saying, I don't work so fast. <laughs> Sometimes it takes months to, to finish a watercolor <coughs> like that. But also, I'm still thinking, um, I'm the cow in the middle and um, the upwardly mobile one. <laughs> And that's a self-portrait, too. I'm the cow. And this is the one that's in the show. That's another in that series. And can you see them? Mm -hmm. OK. Whoops. First of all, this one. Okay, this is very subtle. This is a watercolor, and it took me a couple of months to do. But the cow, you can only see the cow's shadow um, outside the door, just its head. Okay. And that's my husband. <laughs> so I don't always do cows. Sometimes I do wolves. I've left out all the wolves. I, I don't have any wolves in here. And sometimes I do sheep. And then one day, <coughs> remembering this from long ago, this is from the, the 80s or 90s, I, I put them all together into something I'm calling synchronies. And these are individual paintings that I hang together. And there's a lot of you know background meaning and everything, but I'm not going to talk about it. This is 13 feet. I can't, my arms aren't big enough to do that. 13 feet wide and 8 feet deep. There's another version of that first one. And that's the last one. That's a new thing I'm doing now. Teeny tiny little paintings of, uh, of, of abstracts again. And that's all. Thank you.
Hi everyone, how are you doing? Uh, amazing. She's Margaret, beautiful. Uh, I'm Greg Kennedy, and um, um, I'm a potter, and I live in Oregon. I used to live in Idlewild. I taught at Idlewild Arts for about 20 years. But previous to that, um, in, in college, I was a biology major, and my, both my parents were, were uh, technician scientists. And so I was studying biology and chemistry and physics and geology. And, and then I, I took a ceramics class. And then all of a sudden, something flipped inside me. Um, I make pots every day. And we have a beautiful place, just a little place. That's what the road looks like. So if you ever want to come and visit. Uh, the town's called Deadwood. <laughs> Can you believe that? Deadwood. Um, this is what it might look like in winter. So, um, So I, w I w was studying science, and then I discovered pottery, and pottery led me into um, the Japanese tea ceremony. And the Japanese tea ceremony led me to Japan, and Japan led me to Asia. And I've been making my living just from my pots and when I was teaching here. So this is kind of a little different art talk, I guess. And I woke up this morning and um, thought of two words, paradox and am ambiguity. And it's fascinating, a, 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 a paradox versus, an orth versus orthodox. A paradox is a statement or proposition seemingly self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses a possible truth. The second definition is a self-contradictory and false proposition. The third, any person, thing, or situation exhibiting an apparently contradictory nature and for an opinion or statement contradictory to common accepted thought. So the literal definition of paradox is beyond what is thought, or a thought beyond a thought. I don't know what that means. It's a paradox. It's a paradox. <laughs> and ambiguity. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Ambiguity and ambiguous is lacking certainty. It's equivocal. It's puzzling, enigmatic, unclassifiable, uncertain, problematic, open to various interpretations, having several possible explanations. Yes. I don't know how this relates to what I'm talking about, but it does, I guess. Um, these are these little pots that you saw in the gallery, and they're fired very simply. This kind of vertical thing, that's the kiln. And the building behind is my studio. And that's kind of maybe how they look a little bit. But very simple. And my studio is a mess. So I was doing some reading and listening to NPR, and I found.
found this book by Jill Bolte Taylor, and I hope that you might find this book or see her TED Talk. It's at only 20 minutes. It's called My Stroke of Insight. And so I read through that, and it's really fascinating because what she talks about is that our brain is actually two separate kind of organs, side by side, the left and the right. I'm sure you've, this is not news to you. <laughs> and so she is a neuroanatomist, and she had a stroke, and she watched herself go through her stroke and watched her left brain shut down. And when her left brain shut down, she was able to sense her right brain because her left brain, as all of our left brains, it's constantly chattering, right? There's always this internal voice talking, 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 talking. And that keeps us out of our right mind. These photos are just from this spring. Um, in December, I gave uh, food for Lane County, about 120 bowls, so that they could sell the bowls to support, um, to give money, uh, give people food for the hungry people. This is what my backyard looks like. So. After I read that book and a few others this, this last winter, it occurred to me that I had read something like this before. And <laughs> Betty Edwards, right? I think this was written in like 18, uh, 1989, Drawing on the Artist Within. Her first book was drawing on the right side of your brain or something such as that. So she talks about that. She talks about this left brain, right brain dichotomy. And when I'm not in the studio and when I'm not at home, I'm helping my wife cook at retreats, silent meditation retreats. They're called insight meditation. And so the, the, double, the double meaning of my stroke of insight kind of really struck a chord with me. So I better speed up here. The left brain, or the L mode of thinking, it's, it loves logical analysis. It's rational. It likes abstract concepts. It likes scientific and mathematical puzzles, it, it's academic, it's our conscious awareness. We consider it our head. Basically, it, does, it rules our body, right? Our, it's somehow hierarchical above our body, literally and, and uh, culturally, I guess. It's the center of our ego. I talked about the incessant chatter of the mind, that internal dialogue. It's really good at that. It loves reductionism. It loves to simplify reality. It loves to verbal, verbalize. It loves to talk. It's analytical. It loves to name things and categorize things. It's where, we, we, where we're, our reading takes place. It also separates us from the world. It prefers clear, sequential, uncomplicated thought that is not muddied by paradox or ambiguity. It thinks of itself as a solid, independent object. It says to itself, I am living life. And then the right mode, it thinks in pictures, like visual artists. It gathers glimpses, it takes time to ponder, 
It experiences, it's slow to respond, it's nonverbal, it's spatial, it's visual. It's our heart. It loves relationships between things. It radiates pure energy. It is childlike curiosity. The mind explores, swimming in a sea of euphoria. It's the center of mystical insight. It's the sanctuary of the quiet mind. It's our non-ego. It's bliss. It gives us the feeling of oneness and total connection to the whole. One thing at a time, it looks at the whole all at once. It's undaunted by ambiguity. It sees itself as a liquid, not a solid. The right brain is, the right brain's thinking is literally difficult to put into words because it doesn't use words. And so the left brain can't talk to the right brain because they have two different modes of experience. It's invisible to the left mode. Thankfully, we have a structure that's a bridge in our brain that goes between the left and the right. It's called the corpus callosum. And it, in, in, it integrates the two so we feel as one person. It's life living me. I built a deck and a pantry for Nancy and thus gave her some more room for her loom. These are two and three piece pots. I'm working on another set of dinnerware. And this is my cat. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, hi, my name is David Delgado. Um, I am co-teaching uh, the adult ceramic class here at Idlewild Arts with Greg Kennedy. And I feel very privileged to um, be able to stand at the same, po same podium as Greg. Um, so this is my eighth summer here. I started here, let's see, I guess it was summer 2006, and I was the TA. And I was a TA for four years for um, both Greg Kennedy and Eric Cow. And um, they've both been a big part of my life since then. This place has pretty much changed my life. Um, but anyways, so now though, um, outside of here, uh, I live in Oakland, California. And so this is just kind of to give you uh, a view of what you know my pr uh, particular landscape looks like. Um, so just being in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so then, of course, um, San Francisco as well. And... Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I think I just always find that it's really good to preface um, where I'm at just because whether it's conscious or subconscious, it really affects my work a lot. Um, and so um, this is, and so I apologize, this is probably going to be some of the only pottery you're actually going to see. Um, I, so I, I got a degree, I started off in ceramics um, in 2005, and I grew up in Southern California, and so... Um, I found ceramics. It was a, it was a, I don't know, just a wonderful outlet, um, and it, it gave me a lot of space to kind of breathe, I guess you could say. 
And also, like, ceramics was one thing, um, one form of art that it was always giving. Like, I always felt like, um, as a functional potter, that I was constantly giving to people. And so, for th this is probably the, the latest work that I've been doing. And so, this is porcelain and just very highly decorated and just really trying to create surfaces that um, people could discover new things, like, the longer they own it. And so, in that way, just continue to, like, give even after they have it. Okay, but outside of that, <laughs> um, so I got a degree in sculpture um, from the California College of the Arts in Oakland and San Francisco, California, because along the way with ceramics, I also realized that there was a lot more that was going on inside of my head, and, and there was something that uh, a particular material couldn't, um, I don't know, I guess satiate you, I guess that would be the right word. But um, so I started using, I started getting really interested in material and I chose this program um, basically because it wasn't based in a certain actual material. It was all based in ideas and it was based in uh, materiality. And just meaning that um, what materials actually have to say and whether they're juxtaposed or, because um, I also realized that it wasn't, to say what I needed to say in sculpture, um, to focus on a particular uh, mode of making or a particular um, history of crafting, it, it just, it made it more about that than about the ideas that I was, I was thinking about. And so, for instance, like this particular image is, is just to kind of illustrate how I, how I think about materials. And so, up on the top, or, uh, that is a fluorescent light that's been covered in American cheese. And so, on the bottom, so I grew up in Chino, California, and so there's a wonderful little cafe uh, called Flo's Cafe, which is at the Chino Airport, and so that's, uh, I don't know, one of my favorite breakfasts in the world, which is also covered in American cheese. And so, but the, the image on the top actually, so I was invited to go out with, after I had graduated with some professors, um, basically to the middle of nowhere on the Carrizo Plain. And so there was like one outlet, and I brought about like 300 feet of cable with me, of uh, extension cords, and so I wanted to create a meteorite just because I got really interested in the idea of like materials as meteorites. Um, but that, not, no, not so much in a literal sense, I mean, I guess this was like trying to create more of a physical manifestation of that, but the idea really translates more to how materials move people and the fact that it's like the idea of something can, like a meteorite or an asteroid or like the end of the world, like all of those things can cause us to act so irrationally or rational, I mean, or like in our minds, I guess they seem rational. And so, to me, I guess it doesn't seem so silly to put American cheese on a light that has a large history in terms of, you know, processed foods or if you want to talk about, you know, like my own personal history with this, you know, if you're bringing like um, interpersonal or just kind of like external ideas to that, there's a lot that you can actually like glean from it. And so, then again, this, okay, so this was actually on my wall in my studio. And so, part of what I think about a lot are, um, it's like sometimes I think I don't need to actually make something out of plastic material, that there's so much that these things can already do if you just juxtapose them with each other. You know, so like all the walls of my studio in my senior studio at CCA, they were all wood. And so it's like just, you know, that's one step away from, well, not having a studio anymore, I guess. Um, <laughs> So in a literal s in a literal sense, there is there is actually like a lot of like contained energy within that wood and within those matches, but that was just like kind of like, and I framed it just because it was for me that was more of a picture and that was more of a reminder and just a way to think about material and to think about the things that make up our own world, and so um, also, so this piece is called Moby Dick, but it's like Moby Dick like a question with a question mark. Um, just because sometimes our own fears are very irrational, or they at least they seem very irrational. And so, you know, I don't know, whether it's a spider or a pink flamingo that wants to be a gigantic white whale, I don't know. Um, also, I'm very interested in w not just particularly pairing things together, but then even taking real materials and suspending them, and so that they're almost in a frozen action. And so we become witnesses to something. And then that can focus on your own psychology. But just to let you know, I mean, a lot of my work, and as much as I try and get away from it, as much as I try to not even talk about it or think about it, I came from a very violent background. And so I experienced a lot um, when I was younger. And I experienced a lot of hatred from a lot of people growing up. And so because of that, um, there's a lot 
that gets manifest in my work. And so my work is a lot of just trying to work through power relationships. And so whether it's like power relationships in my own personal life or power relationships with looking at world politics or power relationships between our own government, like surveillance issues, anything like that. It's like, so I approach all of these things. So like I approach real material and put them together in ways that help me try to understand those particular relationships. Because even though luckily since my childhood, I've experienced some of the most beautiful people I can imagine, like Greg Kennedy or Eric Cow, people like students that I've had or been in contact with for the past eight years here at Idlewild Arts. Um, it's something that is a constant that I, is a turbulence within my own psychology. And so this was while I was at CCA, and so this was actually an installation and um, performance space for me. And so some of this is like, you know, detritus of real material. So that's a metal desk that I welded together, like a school desk, so that I could sit and read the uh, L or, uh, New York Times. And, um, you know, I felt like I was going to work, you know, because it's, it's just like, I don't know, I guess at that point, dealing with my own internal um, turbulence and then also just every day reading what was going on externally, it, it I don't know, it almost felt like I needed to wear a suit and tie for that. And in that sense, just with that kind of background, it didn't, this doesn't seem so absurd to me. And so then in the end, you just end up with that kind of detritus. Also, if you notice, I also use light a lot. Light has become a very large part of my work. And part of it, you know, it's like studying sculpture and really like things that interested me. I mean, people like Dan Flavin and stuff like that really interested me just from a, an aesthetic perspective. But beyond that, um, for me, light no longer functions in a purely aesthetic form. It, it's all, they're all actors within a space. And so um, light and space itself have become um, extremely uh, important, um, especially because, you know, studying sculpture, I became, I don't know, I almost became like entranced in the idea that, you know, from the histories that we're existing, or from the history that we came from now in sculpture, you know, it's like almost every single thing is sculpture. Every single idea, every single like manifestation in like a physical space is sculpture. And so I like the idea that if light is a sculpture, then everything that light touches also gets sucked into that sculpture. And so you also become unwillingly a participant if you're just in that space. Um, but this uh, was uh, watch me, watch you, watch me. So it becomes a conduit. And so it's like watching this, then that's at like kind of a generalized uh, surveillance camera height, and then having this other like loop. Um, and actually, at like during that performance, I was just still for about three hours straight while people kind of came up and talked in my ear and tried to get me to move. And then this was an installation, well, a, a series of sculptures, but it kind of like took up the entire space um, for my senior show when I was at CCA. And so you came up a set of stairs, and this is kind of what confronted you. And so there's a lot of detailed images. And so that, again, just like frozen movement, just like that kind of idea that you're almost, you know, um, watching a scene, that you've, you've seen something like frozen in time. And that bed's become a wall, so that's covered in drywall. And then that was a meditation space in the gallery, away from a little bit of the chaos. And so I converted a um, um, Virgin of Guadalupe uh, candle into a light. And this is all still part of the space. And so also, like, aside from all of the psychology, it, I again, just being very interested in light and space and how to really um, liven up a space, to activate it. Um, so that when people walk in, it's not me looking at sculpture, it's me being in it, just existing in it, and just completely being immersed. Also, like the material, a lot of the materials in here, um, I try and stay in very far away from things like bronze. I actually kind of find it a very disgusting material. It's just extremely um, time consuming and excessive and it's, it just seems um, like when I, I had to take casting uh, for sculpture and I, I, I was a studio monitor in, in sculpture 
and it, I always tended to be a lot more attracted to all the flashing. Basically, it's all the trash that comes from the bronze casting. And so um, I like the idea that, you know, aluminum duct tape, you know, could be just as shiny as polished bronze. And so it becomes like a mirror. So there are, like, there are materials that are completely affordable for um, somebody like myself who came from a working class background um, that really um, try not to raise up but be a part of the rest of our classes. And that like some really beautiful plastic gold tape. That was pretty nice. And then so later on I had a, um, a friend of mine opened up a gallery in San Francisco and so she it was funny, after seeing my senior show, she was like, I've got the perfect space for you. It's in the basement of my actual gallery. <laughs> it's really dark. <laughs> and I was like, sweet, that's perfect. And it was like half the floor was missing, so there was like exposed dirt. And also it was interesting because this exact space um, used to be a sweatshop in San Francisco in North Beach. And so about two months earlier, there were a bunch of, um, I, I forget how many illegal immigrants, but um, these, uh, fairly young Chinese women sewing those like I heart San Francisco sweaters and stuff and so and this was not too long ago and so there was something very charged about this space and um, so this particular group of work is called we are the storm and so again just more materials um, and just kind of things that I can actually relate to like actually that hand that's my hand but that's microcrystalline wax and so again it was like that was kind of detritus from or not even detritus but that was like working up to doing some casting bronze but it's still the color and texture and ephemerality of it just uh, seemed much more potent to me than just a nice shiny object again light as an actor as opposed to um, just as an object in all of these and then um, sometimes if a light isn't on, it's the content is there. It's more important than if there is something that's on. And then also this, so this was like right before I graduated and just like almost thinking about the anxiety of um, not so much leaving the institution or be being into the world, because I mean, I went to school later, and so I had already worked and everything like that. But I think it was more about the idea of like, how can I, as like an artist, actually make a difference, you know? And, and at the time, you know, of course, I was, you know, had these like kind of grandiose ideas of like, you know, like making, you know, like looking on like a very like kind of like global scale, because like everybody, like, you know, all we talk about now is like globalization and all of these things. And so this was before, you know, I was really happy and accepted that um, I can affect the people directly around me and that is probably the most beautiful thing that I can do. But this was a waving machine and so that's actually like my hand uh, equipped with a uh, drum pedal and uh, homemade rubber bands. <laughs> and that's me. And so then um, not too long ago I was asked to do a show or be in a show in Claremont and so um, this one again, it's just, you know, the precariousness of it. It was definitely more, um, I don't know, something subconscious that just needed to happen, I guess. Um, but those are, that's about, I want to say like a thousand pounds of concrete. So those are all concrete spray, cast concrete spray paint cans. Again, I, just material, finding materials that um, I resonate with and that, you know, resonate within me and actually seem to drive, um, drive home the content of it as opposed to just choosing a material because that's part of the history of sculpture. And then um, just in a group show with some friends. Um, and so I wanted to turn the entire gallery into the head of a hammer. And so I just decided to put the actual body of the hammer into the ceiling. And so I just like the idea of being able to stand within that. But then again, um, it's, it just all goes back to, you know, I guess, it, well actually at this point it's more just kind of accepting that I'll never be able to run away from everything that uh, is going on inside my head. And then just lately I've been playing around a lot with um, 
I don't know, I really enjoy art history and especially like, you know, people like Yves Klein and, you know, one piece that was always like really big to me, but seemed odd to me at the same time when I read about his ideas, um, his, you know, artist jumps into the void. And just because he talked about um, how, you know, we were all part of this void that everything was. But if you know the actual original image, he's jumping into an empty street and there's like one little biker like off in the distance. And so it seemed a lot more appropriate that if he was jumping into the void based on what he said about his ideas, that he would be jumping into the whole of like France or something. And so, um, so yeah, so that's actually a photo from Frank Kappa after um, the Germans left France in World War II. And here's just a little studio shot. This is actually last summer in the ceramic studio here at Idlewild Arts. And so I was just playing around um, with space and materials. But anyways, thank you very much.